Welcome to service, everyone. Uh, let's enjoy uh, the service, the worship, and also let's be challenged by it and let God minister to you uh, in a way uh, that is powerful, intimate, and special in your life. Let me pray for us as we begin the worship today. Father, we thank you for this time and we just ask for your blessings upon this service and we ask that you would um, empower me and also um, be with every member uh, that is listening to the sermon online from home, uh, that their lives will be blessed and that they will be able to encounter you in a powerful way today. Uh, bless everything that we do, uh, keep us from any troubles or any um, uh, obstacles or any uh, difficulties, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, here are some announcements uh, for uh, today. Uh, you know, as we have been announcing for the past few weeks, we have actually decided uh, to open regather on July 4th uh, like uh, we have been uh, announcing or at least uh, try to make an attempt to do so. Mm, uh, we know that after we made that announcement uh, there has been uh, more cases uh, go up and uh, so one thing just to keep in mind is that there's no easy decision uh, when it comes to how to uh, approach, you know, the church moving forward, uh, what the church should do. Uh, there's no easy answer and, um, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just difficult. Um, and, you know, your, your mind can go to all kinds of different places and your opinion can change uh, so many times. Um, but, you know, the, the council, uh, we decided that we were going to open uh, July 4th. Um, and the only reason why this uh, plan is going to continue is because we're following the governor's leadership. Uh, we're, we're following his lead. And at least uh, so far from everything that I've heard from him, and especially yesterday uh, when he made... Uh, an appearance on TV at 12 o'clock to share, you know, give us some updates on how the situation is. Uh, at least until now, although things can change, he hasn't mentioned anything about uh, shutting back down or, uh, you know, stopping the process of reopening, uh, at least for most of California. Uh, basically, he said, if, if I understood correctly, he said that, you know, we are still... Uh, according to the data, uh, safe enough to be able to uh, keep uh, slowly, carefully uh, reopening the state, uh, even though there's cases that are spiking. Uh, and what he did emphasize and beg for was not that, you know, uh, we don't move forward, but he did say, uh, please uh, keep your distance please uh, wash your hands and please wear a mask. Those were the main things that he emphasized and we're following his lead. Um, we're gonna try to do this as safely as possible and we're gonna keep uh, you know, everything that he said to do. And of course, things can change. If things get really, really bad and if the governor uh, asks uh, everybody to stop, even churches uh, from gathering, then at that point, you know, we, we won't be able to continue moving forward with the reopening plan. Uh, but until that happens, uh, we're going to safely uh, try to uh, have a soft reopening of uh, GBC. Now, this means a lot of things. Uh, right now, we are not able to meet, reopen at our own building because there's uh, restrictions on how we can worship, even though we're allowed to come back. Uh, there's restrictions on how we can properly worship, which makes it very difficult for us to actually gather and worship together. So we're not going to go back to our building until uh, our building allows us to, uh, gives us notice that we can now come and uh, worship, you know, uh, in a decent manner. Um, until then, we're going to keep in contact with our uh, building ownership 
uh, to let us know when we can start doing that. Um, also, we are meeting at a temporary location in Buena Park. Uh, it's called First Congregational Church. And you're going to get all the details that you need uh, so that you, if you decide to come, you'll know where the church is at. This is a temporary location that um, is allowing us to meet uh, and, and worship at their facilities. Uh, so we, uh, we have decided, at least for the month of July, to try that out. Also, um, we feel it's safer to actually do it here because we will be the only church that will meet on Saturdays. There's no other groups here that meet, meet on Saturdays, so it'll be only us. Not only that, there's, there's already churches here that are meeting, that have been meeting almost for the past three weeks uh, to a month, and, uh, and they've had no incidents, they have no problems, and they're keeping all the guidelines that are necessary. They already have everything set up. Uh, so that, you know, people can come and worship safely and, and go back home after that. And they've already done it themselves a few weeks, and they've run into no incidents or no trouble. Uh, and because of that, you know, now we feel like it, it's, it's a little bit safer for us to also attempt to start worshiping in this building. Uh, having said all of that, at this moment, we don't uh, encourage anybody to come to worship if you are not uh, comfortable doing so. Uh, this is most likely a, a soft op opening. We're gonna, this is more for us to see and try what reopening uh, will look like and make attempts to, to kind of, you know, by trial and error, try to figure out the reopening of GBC. Uh, mostly the people that will come are people in charge of serving, whether it's worship or uh, or in hygiene, or and, and the families that uh, are okay come to come and worship in person. But we are not uh, even suggesting or recommending that you come. We're, we're actually very strongly suggesting that you stay home and worship online if you don't feel safe, if you're vulnerable, and if you're a little bit older in age. Uh, so don't feel like uh, you have to be part of this reopening. It's, it, we're more kind of like testing and trying out uh, and also preparing ourselves to uh, reopen uh, uh, you know, in, in the future. So, uh, so you are able, you're allowed to come, but don't feel like you have to. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of what we're planning now. Hmm... Uh, we're going to test, this is a season where we're making changes again. So we're going to test a lot of new things, new ways of how we can now uh, worship in person and also online. So for the next few weeks especially, we need to have a lot of your prayers, a lot of patience from you, and a lot of your support. We're going to attempt to possibly do things like live streaming and you know, doing both online and in-person worship. So there's a lot of components that go into that. And uh, we're, we still don't know exactly how to do that. We're, we're trying to figure out things as we go. So we're going to need a lot of patience from you. You might run into problems like all of a sudden, if you're worshiping online, you might lose the entire service because we did something wrong here or, or whatnot. But you know, so just expect, you know, uh, things not to go perfectly for the, at least for the next few weeks as we figure things out. We are going to, our plan is to have in-person worship, possibly live stream, but also we're going to post it on our website, uh, on, on YouTube, so it's on demand. So if you can't worship around the time that we worship at, you'll have it available for you to worship afterwards. The time, the time that we're going to worship at, Starting next week, we're going to experiment with the time of 3.30. We're going to experiment 3.30 worship. This is both online and in person at the same time. So we worship from around 3.30 to about 4.30, 4.40. And then we're going to all... The, the only reason why we're experimenting with this time is so that we can all still Zoom together. Because that's been the biggest blessing that we've had after we went online. The ability to be able to have the whole church come together through Zoom. So we're, we're trying to keep that going. So after we worship from 3.30 to about 4.40, we're 
We're going to do Zoom, those who are at home from home, those who are at church from church. We're going to Zoom for about 45 minutes, and around 5.30, the whole service should be over so that you can join your families and have dinner together. Uh, for those of you who do come to church, there will be a dinner provided to go, uh, something like Chick-fil-A or something, you know, and then uh, so you can take it to go and also enjoy dinner with your family. Uh, that's, uh, as, that's as much as we uh, can share with you now. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please make sure to contact me or any of the council members, and we will be, we will be more than happy to answer your questions. Hello, everyone. It's our worship time. In this uh, difficult time, we have been focusing on the dark side too much. We should refocus back to our God Himself. We all have a story. And what's your story? And what are we going to write on the story?
Today we are in our third sermon in our sermon series um, about the about worship, and this is our third one. And today we're going to dive into the book of Acts. You know, there's a lot of churches, not so much anymore, but in the past, there's still some today. In the past, there's a lot of churches that you know started their church name with the with the word first. So whenever you drive by, you find a church that says First uh, Baptist Church of you know, Orange County or Garden Grove. Or the church I grew up in was called First Presbyterian Church of Orange County. Uh, the title was First. There's a lot of churches in the past that would add the word First uh, before the name of the church uh, came. And I think, I don't know 100% uh, for sure, but I think they did that just to you know, make sure everybody understood that they were the first church of their denomination in that area. I mean, but you know, at the end of the day, what they really wanted perhaps was to be first, right? And that's why they added the word first, you know, before the, their church name. Um, today, we're gonna actually see the real first church the church that was really the first Christian church, the birth of the church, the beginning of the Christian church, we're going to meet the first church that ever, uh, you know, exi- the, the first church that started everything for, for Christianity, the, the first Christian church. The first Christian church was very healthy, vibrant, vibrant, and also, um, uh, you know, they, they were just thriving. We're going to see how the first church was able to be so healthy, so vibrant, so effective in in their witness and in their ministry uh, so that, you know, our church uh, can also uh, find a way to possibly become a church like that. So if you have your Bibles, please open with me to the book of Acts chapter 2 verses 42 to 47. Once again, that's the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, uh, this is what it says. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Uh, this is uh, the first church, uh, the birth of the church, the, the, the way that, that the Christian church started. Uh, and uh, one of the first things that we see is that um, this church uh, was um, the reason why they were able to be so healthy and, and a church that thrived was because they devoted, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the preaching of the word of God, uh, the, the teaching of the word of God, uh, to fellowship, a koinonia, the fellowship, the breaking of bread. Uh, this meant, you know, communion, like kind of how we do communion, but it also meant, you know, having dinners and lunches with uh, members of the church together, gathering together for meals. And also prayer. Prayer um, was part of this thriving and vibrant church. By prayer, they would show their dependence on God, that they needed God's help uh, for their church, for their own lives. So the reason why uh, this uh, church was healthy and vibrant was because, because of two reasons. The first one is because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who gave birth to this church. Right before this passage is Pentecost. Uh, The the first church got started after the Spirit came. 
once the Spirit came in Pentecost, is that the first church was formed. So no church can be formed with human power. Any church that exists, that thrives, and that is doing well and you know is vibrant, there's a lot of good things happening, is not, there's no man-made power that can accomplish something like that. It has to come from God. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives birth to the church. A church can only exist when God is the one in charge, when God is the one who starts that church, who sustains that church, and who ultimately keeps that church going. So all credit goes to God, all responsibility goes to God. God is in complete control of His church. However, like God does with everything in Scripture as far as we can see, Although God is in total control, He's sovereign, He's ultimately the one responsible, He's ultimately the one in power, for whatever reason, He chooses to partner with us to move His kingdom forward. So although God is completely in charge and in control, we also play a part. We play a role in the health and the vibrancy of the church. Because here it says that the believers, the new Jewish believers that became Christians, they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to the teaching. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to uh, prayer. They devoted themselves to gathering together and fellowshipping together and doing communion together. They played their part. They did their role. They loved getting together and devoting themselves to the church. It's the best of both worlds. Because God is in charge, so we, especially pastors, don't have to bear the responsibility of thinking that the church rising or falling depends on us. It doesn't. We don't have that kind of power. It's ultimately in God's hands. He is in control. It is His church. However, we can't get lazy because we also play a role. We play a part. So we have no burden in terms of what happens to the church because that's in God's hands. He's ultimately in control. But we also get to participate and play a role in, in, in what happens in the church. It's, it's kind of difficult to fully understand, but it's the best of both worlds because we don't get lazy and we don't get burdened because God is in control. We also need to do our part. Now, the word devoted there, the word devoted actually is the word that controls this. This is a long sentence. Verse 42 to 47 is one long sentence. And the word devoted is the word that controls the entire sentence. So it's a key word. The word devoted controls the entire sentence. And here by devoted, it basically simply means to give yourself away. Devoted has this sense of you being so committed to something fully, wholeheartedly, 100%, sacrificially, you give yourself away for that cause. You give yourself away for the church. You give yourself away for, for whatever you know, you're giving away, away yourself too. And that's what the word devoted means, to give yourself away. And here, of course, of course, it's saying that the believers devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and, and to prayer. And that's true. But like Tim Keller says, here really what the, what the believers are devoting themselves to is they're devoting themselves to God and they're devoting themselves to one another. There's this strong devotion. They're giving themselves away to God and they're giving themselves away to one another. And we can totally see that in this whole passage, right? They were so sacrificially giving themselves away to one another. And, you know, like Tim Keller says, if you read this passage, interestingly so, the word together is repeated very often. Very often. They gave themselves away to each other, they met together, they ate together, they, they, they fellowship, they did everything together. They made the effort of, of coming together. Uh, together in the temple every day, together in their homes afterwards every day, they ate together, they, they did everything together. They did everything together. They gave themselves away to one another. They sacrificially loved each other. You know, and this is, this is a mark of true spiritual maturity. This is what happens to those who are really growing spiritually. They went from, this is how we know that they totally gave themselves away to each other. They went from me, 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 mine, 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 accumulating more for me, me, me in this life to now starting to slowly, you know, slow uh, open up the, the strongly gripped, 
you know hands or you know the, just strongly you know holding everything into for themselves to now opening their hands to st start to share it with others they went from me mine gathering accumulating more for me to now i'm gonna actually sell what's mine if i see somebody in need if i see a believer in need in the church i'm gonna start selling my stuff for them they went from me mine accumulating more for me to now i'm gonna start giving it away i'm gonna start giving myself away and in, and in this passage we see that they did that with the believers that were poor uh, they would sell their possessions this, this doesn't mean that they sold sold everything at one point it doesn't mean that you know we can't have a house it doesn't mean any of that because later it says that they met in people's homes <laughs> What it does mean is that we go from a posture of like me, mine, gathering to not being devoted, to giving it away, giving ourselves away. Not just saying that, not just limiting ourselves, not just doing the bare minimum, but actually really sacrificially giving ourselves away, devoting ourselves to one another, giving ourselves away if there's another believer, another brother or sister poor in need. That's what they started doing. They gave themselves away. They devoted themselves to one another. They devoted themselves to God. They, 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 they were eager to come and, and learn from the apostles' teaching. They prayed. Their, their worship was dynamic. It wasn't just the, the teaching of the word. Like, like, I, like I keep on saying, yes, the teaching of the word is crucial, important. But the praise, the worship was dynamic too. If you can see this entire path, they were singing with joy. You know, the, the praise was good. The worship was good. They, would, they were worshiping the temple every single day with glad hearts, with joy, loudly, you know, extravagantly. And then they would go to people's homes and they would worship some more. They would pray some more. They were all about giving away. They were, the, the rich believers would open their homes to invite people over. You know, they would share their, 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 their resources so that other believers can come together. Now, that's what was happening in this passage. Um, and, 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 and when the, when the church was like this, by the way, they met, the people that met together, the, these believers that met together, they were all, uh, from different cultures and different languages, right? If you read the passages later before this, it says that they all spoke different languages, right? So these are people coming together from different backgrounds, different languages, different, you know, racial uh, backgrounds and, and, and none of that, you know, got in the way. They, they it, it didn't matter if they were different from them. It didn't matter if they were from a different language or race. They still were able to come together and devote themselves to one another. It was a multi-ethnic church. The very, very first church was a multi-ethnic church. It wasn't a church that just said, it's just for, you know, uh, Chinese people is just for Korean people is just for Mexican people no it was for everybody everybody's welcome every gender is welcome every nationality is welcome every age is welcome it's open to all this was pretty dramatic is is open to the poor is open to the rich is open to the smart is open to the not so smart <laughs> and when this church became so attractive because it was multi-ethnic because it was for everybody because it was so sacrificial because there was so much devotion there was so much love for one another it became infectious it became so attractive that everybody outside was seeing what was happening and they wanted to join they wanted to join such an amazing organism an amazing church something they've never seen before with any other religion something they've never seen before with any any, any greek philosopher something that philosophy or religion were not able to provide for them they found in the first church and they wanted to join that church that's why the church just kept on growing and growing and growing um, from this point forward for many, many years, many centuries in the history of the church. You know, the reason why the first church was able to explode in this way was because the first church was devoted. That's the key word. That's the word that's controlling our passage today. The first church was devoted. The first church wasn't, you know, limiting themselves uh, to just comf comfort or convenience. The first church 
wasn't just you know about me and my priorities and my needs and what I can do and if I don't have time like I can go to church it wasn't like that it was me that me comes last and we comes first they devoted themselves to the group to the community to the church the only reason why the first church really thrived was because people were all in People were all in. They were devoted. They, were, they gave themselves away wholeheartedly to God and to the people. And we all know that this is how life works. If you give yourself half-heartedly to something, you shouldn't ever expect anything great to come out of that. The only way you can expect something great to come out of whatever you're trying to do is if you give, give yourself to it wholeheartedly. You give yourself away. Only when you devote yourself in that way, only when you give yourself in that way, you can expect great results. No different with the church. If, if most of the church is only about comfort and convenience and me, mine, for me mentality, then that church shouldn't expect anything great to, to come out of that community. The very first church is showing us that from the very beginning, what made this church so special was true devotion, was sacrificial devotion. You know, we went to Mexicali, some of us, a couple of years ago, I think already, or maybe last year, and we met the missionary there, the Mexicali missionary. Uh, this is a Korean missionary who devoted his life to Mexicali for missions for the past 20 years. We saw his ministry, right? He was able to build, I think, like 10 churches, 9 or 10 churches. Uh, he started 9 or 10 churches in Mexicali, and then he built buildings for all of those churches. So he started and built 9 or 10 churches, and then he started and built a rehab center for drug addicts. This was a drug rehab center. And then he also built a very beautiful facility for the disabled community so that they can come and get helped. And then when we were there, he, he was working on, on a much bigger project. He went to the poorest area of Mexicali, a place where there was no electricity and no water. And remember, for those of you who went with me, remember what he was trying to do? He was literally trying to start a new city amongst the poor, the poorest area of Mexicali, where he was trying to bring in water, clean water. He was trying to bring in clean electricity. He was building homes for the people there that didn't have homes to live in. He was trying to build a market, a school, a hospital. This was like God-sized dream, and he had already gotten started. He already accomplished so much and in his last years of service to the Lord perhaps that he has left, he's actually uh, you know, embarking on, on his greatest challenge probably yet. It was, it was amazing everything we saw that he accomplished in Mexicali, but do you know how all of that actually started? Do you know how he was able to accomplish so much and build so much? 20 years ago, he went to Mexico with only his wife and no money. Only his wife and no money and just with faith in the Lord. Faith that the Lord would use this missionary and his wife if they devoted themselves, if they gave themselves away wholeheartedly to the Lord. The Lord will do something with that kind of devotion. He went to Mexico only with his wife and then he called seven families from Paraguay. He calls seven families from Paraguay because Paraguay is where he came from, where he previously did ministry at. He moved from Paraguay to Mexicali, if I remember correctly. He called seven families that he was close to from Paraguay and he told them, move to Mexicali. He told them, move to Mexicali, sell everything you have, leave your established and comfortable lives in Paraguay, Come here to Mexicali where you know nothing about, where your life might get more difficult. Come here, devote yourselves wholeheartedly with me to start a church, to do ministry here. 
<laughs> Miraculously, these seven families, they sold everything they had. They left their old, comfortable and established lives. They joined the missionary and the rest is history. The reason why they were able to experience so much favor, the reason why they were able to accomplish so much was because they devoted themselves fully. They gave themselves fully to each other and to God. And God started to move and do us 20 years. Maybe somebody you would know better, uh, he's, he's famous and that's the only reason why I bring him up. His church is famous. Um, uh, Elevation Church. Many of you have heard of Elevation Church. Pastor, Pastor Stephen Furtick, Elevation Worship is very popular right now. A lot of people sing their songs. So this pastor is very well known. His church is very well known. One of the largest churches perhaps in America. Every Christian that I know has listened to his sermons. They listen to his songs. Everybody that I know of knows Elevation Church, knows Pastor Stephen Furtick. They have so much influence. They have so much uh, notoriety and, and, and they're well known. But do you know how everything started for that church? Do you know how everything started for Pastor Stephen Furtick and Elevation Church? Pastor Stephen Furtick was a worship pastor in a church in North Carolina. When he was 27 years old, he felt God called him to plant a church in Charlotte. So he left everything, a comfortable position in a nice church as a worship pastor. He left all of that. And he followed the Lord, what he believed was to be the Lord's calling to start a church in Charlotte. And him and his wife, at age 27, both of them, they went to Charlotte to start a church. They believed the Lord wanted them to do that. Before he went, again, I don't know what, what it is with number seven, but before he, went, before he went, if I remember correctly, he asked seven families, seven families that were well-established, much older than him, they had good, comfortable lives. They had a lot of, they had homes and assets in North Carolina. He asked seven families to join him and his wife, to move with him to Charlotte, to start a new church, to start Elevation Church. Again, miraculously, all of these families, I don't know what they were thinking. They sold everything and they decided to follow a 27-year-old young pastor. You know, just wholeheartedly gave themselves completely to the church, completely to his vision. They all moved to Charlotte and they started Elevation Church. And they did have, of course, trials and tribulations and difficulties in the first few years. But we all know how Elevation Church now is influencing people all over the world. God is using that church. Regardless if, you know, uh, whether we agree with uh, their theology and things like that. I actually don't know too much about their theology, uh, but I'm just, you know, talking about the impact that they're having as a Christian church. It all started with wholehearted devotion. The first church that ever started, the first Christian church up until now, 2020, churches today, it's the same thing. God uses people, God uses Christians, God uses churches, God moves through churches and people and Christians who devote themselves to God and to one another, who wholeheartedly, sacrificially, they just give themselves away for the cause of God. They give themselves away to God. They give themselves away to one another. Anybody who's like that, God will use and move powerfully through. The first church is showing that. Churches today are showing us that. God will never do anything significant or move through churches that are self-centered, inward-looking, and only care about giving bare minimum to their own church or to whatever God is trying to do. Churches like that should not expect God to move in a powerful way. The only way that, the only way that, you know, how things work in life, even in life, it's a life principle. You only get really a lot out of something if you're all in, if you're devoted fully. If you're half-heartedly devoted or you just try to do bare minimum, your life will not amount to much in anything that you do. It's the same with the church. 
if you want to see your church thrive, if you want to see you know, your church be healthy, if you want to see God do something meaningful and important in your life, and if you want to see God perhaps use your church, then there is no other way. There is no denying the fact that you're going to have to be devoted. You're going to have to show devotion. You are going to have to show sacrificial devotion if you want to see God powerfully move through you and through your church. May that be true of you, of me, and of our church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that you, know, you help us to become uh, Christians that are devoted to you, Lord, uh, that are devoted to one another wholeheartedly. Let us restore and recover this raw passion and desire to be able to give it all away to you, to just trust you wholeheartedly without reservations or limitations, to see you move powerfully in our lives and in our communities and in our churches. Change our hearts from being resistant and perhaps only limited and only wanting to give you bare minimum to giving you everything. This one life that we have, let us not reserve it for comfort and whatever good things we can have from this life, but let us lose it for you. Let us devote it wholeheartedly to you. Teach us, help us, change us to devote ourselves wholeheartedly to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
All right, let's do the benediction now. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.